Hey guys, welcome back. Today I'll be doing the character Edmund from the play King Lear by William Shakespeare. So, who is really Edmund, what he does, and why is he so important? I'll be going through all the acts of Edmund as well as analyzing his roles deeply. Now, in, by the way, I'm gonna do this in uh, by scene by scene. So, act one, scene one, Gloucester introduces his illegitimate son. Yes, you guessed it, that would be Edmund. Uh, he introduces him to Kent, and he jokes about Edmund's conception, saying that there was good sport at his making, and the whore son must be acknowledged. These are our quotes. So, guys, I'll be mentioning a lot of quotes as far as I analyze the character Edmund, so please maybe note them down, or uh, come back to the video and reread them, or re-listen to them, or whatever, whatever way that will satisfy you. Now... Although he's saying that uh, Edmund wasn't either never planned or nor even wanted and this hurts kind of to Edmund and Edmund says nothing during this exchange but answers politely when Kent speaks to him. So far so good. Gloucester tells Kent that Edmund has been away for nine years and away he shall again, presumably to seek his fortune. Now, in terms of the analysis, Shakespeare's audience would have realized the significance of Edmund's illegitimacy. At the time, only legitimate children could inherit their parents' titles and wealth. Therefore, Edmund is in a very weak position in society. Seeking his fortune abroad seems to be Edmund's only realistic option of making a better life for himself at this stage in the play. Now, Gloucester seems to love Edmund, even if he expresses himself rather clumsily, but Edmund has good cause to be upset by his father's insensitivity. Now, in Act 1, Scene 2, this scene opens with Edmund's soliloquy. This is very important. He is bitter and that he cannot be Gloucester's heir because he is an illegitimate younger son. He says he is just as good as a son born in wedlock, if not better, because he was conceived, and I quote, in the lusty stealth of nature, rather done, and I quote, a dull, stale, tired bed. Now, he is determined to have what he sees as his right. Legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. This is what he says. He vows that Edmund, the base, shall do the legitimate and ends his soliloquy with a rousing cry. He says, now gods stand up for bastards. This is a very, very famous soliloquy. I suggest to go over it, reread it, uh, maybe have a quote or two, a line or two from this. Now, Gloucester enters full of news of Lear's shocking decisions during the love test. Remember, he's dividing his kingdom. Edmund now reveals the first part of this plan, of his plan. Uh, he makes sure that Gloucester sees him trying to hide a letter and reluctantly allows himself to be persuaded to hand it over. Very smart and cunning. In the letter which Edmund has forged, Edgar supposedly asks Edmund to join him in a plot to kill Gloucester and divide his wealth between them. This is the first way that we can see how Edmund is starting to become villainous, but still we like him. This is why he's not a classical villain that we don't like. Edmund cunningly pretends to find it hard to believe Edgar could mean what he says and advises Gloucester to let him establish the truth of the matter. He's being all that, you know, lovey-dovey brother. Meanwhile, he is the one who set it all up. Now, Gloucester readily agrees to Edmund's plan to have him spy on the conversation between himself and Edgar before lamenting that such unnatural behavior is a result of the star's unfavorable influence astronomy because people in Elizabethan Shakespearean times believed a lot more than they believe now in astrology. Alone, once more, Edmund gloats over the success of his plan. He scorns Gloucester's belief in astrology, saying that he, Edmund, should have been the same person, he says, had the maiden like stare or star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Very hard to, uh, to pronounce and even to spell, but very nice to quote in your essays as well. Edgar enters and Edmund asks him if he has argued with their father or offended him in some way. And Edgar is bewildered and says, some villain hath done me wrong. Now Edgar assumes that something is wrong and someone has screwed him over. He doesn't know it's his own brother though, or half brother. Edmund advises him to go armed at all times and to hide himself in Edmund's rooms for the time being and Edgar leaves. 
Edmund is delighted that he has managed to manipulate his father as well as his brother and says that he is particularly lucky as their goodness can be turned against them. This is what he says, a credulous father and a brother noble whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none on whose foolish honesty my practices ride easy. Although he cannot inherit according to the law of the land as it stands, Edmund intends to have lands by wit. Now, in terms of the analysis of this scene, he um, this scene introduces the subplot. Remember, the main plot is King Lear and his daughters and the inheritance and the division of the kingdom and all that. Lear's madness, Cordelia's death. This is the subplot that occurs between another family and it's very important too. Now, same as the main plot, a father makes a fatal error of judgment and places his trust in the wrong child, Edmund. And Edmund has genuine cause to feel he has been treated unfairly. This is why we sympathize with him. He points out that it is only an accident at birth, which is no way his fault. That leaves him unable to inherit from his father. Why is it my fault if my father slept with a woman that he didn't marry and had me accidentally? Now, Edmund refuses to abide by the existing law and class system, vowing instead to follow the laws of nature and ensure his succession to Gloucester's titles and lands. The forged letter reveals Edmund's feelings about Gloucester. In it, he has Edgar claim that Gloucester is too old to rule and should stand aside to allow his younger and more capable son take over. Now, Edmund manipulates the audience as cunningly as he manipulates his father and brother. It is difficult not to feel sympathy for Edmund's position and to agree that it is wrong he should be left without an inheritance through, uh, th uh, through no fault of his own. His scorn of Gloucester's belief in astrology and his forged letters succeed in making Gloucester appear foolish and gullible just as his questions and warnings unnerve Edgar and panic him into accepting a story that would not stand up to any scrutiny. Edmund may not be admirable, but he appears far more in control and far more rational than Gloucester and Edgar in the sense, or in the scene itself. Edmund's attack on astrology makes it clear that humans are responsible for their own behavior and that the influence of the stars cannot be blamed for a person's actions, very much logical to today's world. No offense to anyone who believes in astrology as much as um, Edgar and Gloucester do. Now, Edmund, like Goneril and Regan, is an excellent judge of character. Just as Lear's elder daughters know what lies and flattery uh, will succeed in persuading their father to reward them, so Edmund is well aware of the best way to exploit his father's and brother's weaknesses. Now, in Act 2, Scene 1, Curran, a courtier, tells Edmund that Cornwall and Regan are on their way to Gloucester's castle and that there is a division between Albany and Cornwall. And Edmund is delighted to hear this news and immediately begins to work out a way he can use Cornwall's visit to his advantage. Now Edgar enters and Edmund advises him to flee while he still can. He implies that the reason for his uh, for Cornwall's visit is that he that it is rumored Edgar has spoken against him and Edgar confused and caught off guard instinctively trusts Edmund when the latter suddenly draws his sword and tells Edgar that they must stage a fight to make Gloucester believe that they are not working together do you see the level of planning and cunning way of manipulating both the father and the brother by Edmund they fight briefly and Edmund tells Edgar to run off as Gloucester approaches when Edgar has left. Edmund wounds himself to make it look like as if Edgar has injured him and Gloucester arrives and asks Edmund where Edgar is. Edmund tells him that he fled after attacking him and mumbling of wicked charms. He says attacked him because he would not join him in a plot to murder Gloucester. He's turning the brother against the father. Seeing how loathly opposite I stood to his unnatural purpose in fell motion, with his prepared sword he charges home, my unprovided body, very important. Gloucester believes Edmund, even when he says that Edgar swore he would deny everything if caught and that everyone would take his word against that of an unpossessing bastard. Gloucester even promises to make Edmund capable, in other words, make him a legitimate heir. 
Now Cornwall and Regan or Regan arrive and immediately take Edmund's side. Regan asks if Edgar was friendly with Lear's righteous knights and Edmund promptly says he was. And Cornwall praises Edmund saying he has shown Gloucester a childlike office. He says that he will take Edmund into his service because he will need natures of such deep trust. In the coming days, uh, Edmund thanks him and he accepts. Now Edmund is going up the ladder in terms of power, responsibility and growth. Now in terms of the analysis of this Act 2 Scene 1, Edmund is shown to be a quick thinking opportunist. He seizes on every chance to further his cause and sees straight away how he can turn Regan and Cornwall's visit to his advantage. Once again, he bombards Edgar with startling questions and does not allow his brother time to think before urging him to quickly stage a fight and flee. Edmund's success in persuading Gloucester to trust him rather than Edgar would carry more weight with a Shakespearean audience than it does today. Very important for the cultural context. They would have expected the legitimate son to be trusted and the illegitimate son to be viewed with some suspicion. Edmund, knowing this, ensures that Edgar is never allowed to plead his case and he brilliantly preempts Edgar's defense by saying Edgar gloated that nobody would believe an unpossessing bastard. This reversal of the, na of the natural order, the illegitimate son being favored over the legitimate son, can be seen as further evidence of a world turned upside down after Lear's disastrous decisions. Lear participated the uh, precipitated the breakdown of natural family structures and the subplot mirrors exactly this. And Gloucester, as we have seen, is deeply superstitious. So would be horrified by Edmund's claim that Edgar called on black magic to aid him. There is great irony in Cornwall's claim that Edmund has shown a natural and proper devotion to Gloucester and that he is highly trustworthy. Uh, in terms of Act 3, Scene 3, Gloucester confines in Edmund, telling him that he is unhappy with the way Lear has been treated by Goneril, Regan and Cornwall, and Edmund readily joins him in condemning such behavior, calling it most savage and unnatural. Gloucester tells Edmund that he has received a secret letter telling him of the arrival of the French. He plans to help Lear, although he has been forbidden to do so. He leaves. Alone on stage, in Act 3, Scene 3, Edmund vows to tell Cornwall about the letter and about Gloucester's decision to go to the king's aid. He believes that he will benefit greatly from betraying his father in this way. And he says, the younger rises when the old doth fail. Very important. Analysis. There's great dramatic irony in this scene. Gloucester bemoans the unnatural and cruel way Lear has been treated by Cornwall and his daughters, little knowing that the son in whom he is confiding plans to do the same or worse to him if he can. Gloucester is unwittingly providing Edmund with the opportunity to betray him. Edmund continues to lie easily, pretending to agree with Gloucester and hypocritically denouncing Lear's daughters and son-in-law as savage and unnatural when he is both of those things. Now Edmund once again shows how opportunistic he is. He jumps at this chance to betray his father to Cornwall. And Edmund appears to have no conscience and is not in the least troubled at the thought of bringing about Gloucester's downfall. Now in Act 3, Scene 5, Edmund and Cornwall discuss Gloucester. Edmund shows Cornwall the letter, providing Gloucester is in communication with Cordelia's French forces. Edmund pretends to be conflicted and to worry that he will be harshly judged for putting duty to his country before his duty to his father. He laments how malicious is my fortune that I must repent to be just and feigns deep distress at having to betray Gloucester. Cornwall rewards Edmund for informing on his father by making him Earl of Gloucester. He tells him to find Gloucester so he can be punished and promises to be like a father to Edmund from now on. In an aside, Edmund hopes he can catch his father offering help and comfort to Lear as it will strengthen the case against him. Now in terms of the analysis of Act 3, Scene 5, Edmund's plan is coming to fruition. Uh... 
He vowed to gain Gloucester's title and lands, and to have both Gloucester and Edgar cast down. It now appears that he will have all he has plotted and schemed to achieve, and Edgar is blatantly hypocritical, claiming to be torn between his country and his father. In reality, he only serves himself, and this short scene highlights the unnatural dealings of the play. Edmund is willing to sacrifice his father to achieve his own ends, and he openly admits to the audience that he hopes he can catch Gloucester in an act of treachery, so he will definitely be found guilty and punished. And Edmund cares nothing for the ties and duties of family, and is more than happy that the powerful and evil Cornwall will replace his natural father. Although the audience may have had some sympathy with Edmund's cause at the start of the play, any trace of it vanishes now that he has shown the depth of his depravity and the length to which he is willing to go to get what he wants. The alliance between Cornwall and Edmund creates great tension as it seems Gloucester is in serious danger. Now in Act 3, Scene 7, Edmund is present as Cornwall, Goneril and Regan plan to arrest and torture, you guessed it, the father of Edmund, Gloucester. Cornwall tells him to bring Goneril home and to urge Albany to prepare for war. The punishments Cornwall intends to inflict on Gloucester will be so dreadful that he does not believe Edmund should see them. For the analysis of scene 7 of Act 3, although Edmund does not speak in the scene, uh, his tacit approval of Cornwall's terrible plan to torture Gloucester shows how evil and unnatural a son he really is. And shifting to Act 4, Scene 2, Edmund and Goneril have arrived at Goneril and Albany's palace. Goneril has heard that Albany is greatly changed and seems to support Lear and Gloucester and to disapprove of Edmund's rise to power. On hearing this, Goneril advises Edmund to return to Cornwall and the change in their husbands in the change in her husband makes Edmund even more desirable to Goneril, and she makes it clear that he that she wants him to take Albany's place killing him ne if necessary. Now Edmund simply replies, yours in the ranks of death, before he leaves. For the analysis of Act 4, Scene 2, while he lays little in this scene, Edmund nonetheless plays an important role as usual. Goneril and Regan will become increasingly caught up in their fight to win him, and will tear each other apart in the process. An audience at the time of the play was written uh, would have been shocked to think that an illegitimate son could not only rise to the rank of Earl but could be considered a suitable wife for the Queen. Now Edmund's line, yours in the ranks of death can be interpreted in a number of ways. Now some see it as a rather unenthusiastic and formulaic response to Goneril's vows of love, others see it as Edmund's way of keeping his options open by appearing to swear allegiance to Goneril because he does not know yet whether he will accept her offer or Regan's. Uh, his words can also be read as overtly, overtly sexual and rather shocking. The expression, the ranks of death, were used, or was used, to refer to sexual climax at that time, which is very important for you to know. Shifting to the final act, scene one, the battle is about to begin. Um, and Edmund wonders if Albany still intends to fight. Regan is more interested in Edmund and whether or not he has been intimate with Goneril. He assures her that he feels only respectable of or honored love for Goneril and appears shocked at the thought he could have ever leave an, uh, have, an affair to, uh, have an affair with a married woman. So he's still plotting a scheming, still succeeding till the final act. We'll see what happens in a second. Albany arrives and Edmund urges him to prepare his army for battle as quickly as possible. Alone on stage now, oh, at the end of this scene, Edmund reflects on Goneril and Regan's desire to marry him. And he wonders, which of them shall I take? Both, one or neither? And he reflects that he cannot have one if the other remains alive. So as they are so jealous of one another. Goneril has asked him to kill Albany, but Edmund says he needs him for the coming battle, after which Goneril can murder herself, uh, can murder him herself if she is so eager to be uh, rid of him. Now Edmund also reveals his intentions for Lear and Cordelia. He plans to have them executed as soon as he captures them. Very much villainous. Um, 
For the analysis, Edmund's comments at the start of the scene remind us of the division within the British forces. Albany is reluctant to fight and the audience may reasonably wonder if his attitude will adversely affect the chances of a British win. Edmund's hypocrisy is clear as he pretends to be too honorable to sleep with a married woman. Compared to his other sins, this would be a relatively minor transgression and one of which he is certainly capable. Uh, they may be consumed with desire for Edmund, but he has little interest in Goneril or Regan beyond wondering how an alliance with either would benefit him. So he's all about him. Uh, he is willing to take either one or neither, and if he marries either one, he will be king, which is very important to him. Goneril wants Edmund to kill Albany, but he makes it clear that he will not, and Edmund prefers to plot and to allow others to carry out the actual unsavory acts that result from his scheming rather than doing it himself. Um, he was not there when Gloucester was blinded and he will not kill Albany and later in the play he will order uh, another soldier to execute Cordelia and Lear therefore saying or implying that he doesn't really do the dirty work himself. Now Edmund's cold ruthless nature is to the fore once more in this scene. He intends to have Lear and Cordelia killed at, as their survival threatens his chance of becoming king. Edmund's rapid rise to power and the very real possibility that he may be king would be shocking for any audience considering his evil and corrupt nature, but a Shakespearean audience would have been appalled to think of such a man ruling. His ascent shows the danger that can arise when the divinely appointed king abdicates or abdicates his responsibilities. And the final scene for which Edmund is involved is in Act 5, Scene 3. He captured Lear and Cordelia, orders a captain to follow them to prison and to execute them there. He promises the man promotion to the, to the nobility if he does the deed. Albany enters with Goneril and Regan and demands that Edmund hands over Lear and Cordelia. Edmund tries to avoid doing so without directly challenging Albany. Albany makes it clear that he does not view Edmund as an equal and expects to be obeyed. Goneril and Regan begin fighting over Edmund, distracting Albany. Edgar has given Albany Goneril's letter to Edmund. So Albany now charges Edmund with treason and calls on a champion to fight him in single combat. Edgar appears and, although Edmund points out that he need not fight an unarmed and possibly inferior opponent, he is impressed by Edgar's noble voice and bearing. They fight and Edmund is mortally wounded. Albany shows him the letter from Goneril and asks if he knows what it contains. Edmund admits his guilt and asks Edgar to reveal his true identity so he can know who killed him. It is a nobleman, he will forgive him. If it is a noble, he will forgive him, and Edgar tells him who he is, and Edmund realizes the wheel is come full circle, 360 degrees, and his fortunes have fallen once again. Edgar tells the story of Gloucester's journey to Dover in and his death, and Edmund is deeply moved and says Edgar's speech may yet to do some good. He encourages him to, to tell him more. A gentleman enters with the news that Goneril and Regan are dead, and Edmund reflects that he was contracted to them both, but now all three will soon be joined in death rather than marriage. Very ironic. He points out that he was beloved because the sisters died as a result of their jealous fight for him. With his last breaths, Edmund says, Some good I mean to do, despite of my own nature. He admits that he ordered Lear and Cordelia's execution and says he hopes they may still be saved. He is carried off stage and sometime later a messenger says he is dead. Albany dismisses the news as but a trifle. So the last analysis of this last scene where Edmund is involved uh, Edmund shows his unwillingness to carry out the dreadful deeds. He instructs a soldier to kill Lear and uh, Cordelia. He raises and dashes the audience's hope that Lear and Cordelia may be saved, adding almost unbearable tension to the final scene. Uh, his order to the soldier coming as so soon after Lear and Cordelia loving exchange darkens the mood and seems to indicate that there is no hope for the king and his beloved daughter. However, Albany's challenge to Edmund raises the possibility that Lear and Cordelia may be saved, particularly when he is unmoved by Edmund's attempt to manipulate him into agreeing to wait until a more opportune, opportune time to deal with them. This hope is quickly dashed, however, as Regan and Goneril fight over Edmund and distract Albany, as Edmund 
lies dying, he hints that he may finally do some good as a result of Edgar's moving speech. But he does not do so immediately. When he finally does admit that what he has done, the audience is keenly aware that a long time has passed since the soldier followed Lear and Cordelia to prisons probably too late. And right to the end, Edmund is concerned with his position in society. He also says he will forgive Edgar for mortally wounding him if he is a nobleman. The most important thing in Edmund's view is that he is killed by someone of high social class rather than by just someone, a commoner, for instance. Whether or not Edmund redeems himself at the end of the play is a matter of opinion to you. Uh, some say that he does not repent and some say that he does. Others believe that he remains selfish and manipulative until the end. Whichever view you take, you may want to use it, that's fine. Shakespeare clearly does not want to evoke much sympathy for Edmund. Uh, and when Albany hears of his death, he dismisses it as merely trifle and expresses no pity or sorrow. So guys, thank you very much for being here. This is everything and I think more than what you need. Let me know if you have any questions or put a comment down below. Thank you and have a good day.